Hello, I'm uh, Debbie Doyle with the American Historical Association, and thank you for attending our session on the public and the historical enterprise. What do they know and what do they do, which is part of the AHA colloquium series of virtual AHA. We're excited to have you join us and are looking forward to a productive discussion. I would like to thank our generous sponsors, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Stanton Foundation, the History Channel, and Oxford University Press. You can support virtual AHA and other AHA activities by joining the AHA, or if you're already a member, making a donation today. We'll post links with details in the chat. A few logistical things to cover before we start the webinar. By registering for or participating in the AHA's webinars, participants and panelists agree to abide by the AHA's Code of Professional Conduct. Please use the Q&A function to submit questions to the presenters. We hope to address all relevant questions, but may want we also want to be mindful of the time, so we may paraphrase or combine questions if, if it seems prudent. If you'd like to be a part of the conversation on social media, remember to use the virtual AHA hashtag. Finally, a quick reminder that this webinar is being recorded and we will share a recording on the AHA YouTube channel after uh, the session today. I'll now turn it over to our chair, Karen Berkowitz from the New Jersey Council for the Humanities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie, <clears throat> and thank you all who are spending your afternoon with us today. Uh, as Debbie said, I'm Karin Berkowitz, and I'm a historian of science by training, uh, but I'm delighted to be chairing this session today. In my current role as executive director of the New Jersey Council for the Humanities, I'm very interested in the central question that it addresses. Uh, so let me move on to introducing our panelists. John Dictel is the president and CEO of the American Association for State and Local History and the former executive director of the National Council on Public History. Peter Burkholder is professor of history at Fairleigh Dickinson University, and he's on the editorial board of the teaching professor and on the national advisory board of the Society for History and for History Education. His research interests include history pedagogy, history and film, and medieval warfare. Robert Townsend oversees the Washington office of the American Academy and the day-to-day -day work of the humanities indicators. Prior to joining the Academy, he spent 24 years at the American Historical Association. So all of our panelists are distinguished and, and know very much uh, of which they speak today. Um, it'll be great to hear their thoughts. So let's, without further ado, jump right in. Uh, John Dictel is going to go ahead and, and present first for us today. Uh, and I just want to reiterate what Debbie said. Please feel free to post questions in the Q&A as we go along. And I will go ahead and do my best to summarize them and pass them along to our panelists as we go. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Karen. Hi, everyone. Again, I'm John Dictel from the American Association for State and Local History. And the project I want to describe for you is something we started two years ago with a, an Andrew W. Mellon Foundation grant. Um, we still have probably another six to eight months to go on the project, and then will come the process of uh, taking our findings and turning them into um, turning them into tools and resources that the entire discipline of history can use for uh, for for communicating how we do our work even better. So our, our project is called Framing History with the American Public. And uh, we're doing it in partnership with the Organization of American Historians and the National Council on Public History, and also with the Frameworks Institute in Washington, DC. And it's really the Frameworks Institute that is conducting uh, the research for us, bringing findings back to us periodically. We have groups of advisors that meet and go through these findings. And um, I guess a word about the Frameworks Institute, it's a MacArthur award-winning um, nonprofit research organization that uses social science methods to study how people understand social issues. And so they're going to help us look at the gaps between how professionals, professional historians, museum curators, park service employees, how professionals think and talk about history and the gap um, that there is with how the general public thinks and talks about history. And then they're going to help us produce communication um, sort of framing devices. Um, so the word frame, framing and frameworks uh, will come up a lot in what I'm, what I'm talking about here. So um, 
we are um, in the prescriptive phase. We're in the second phase of the, the project. So it started with a descriptive phase where frameworks researchers interviewed um, a dozen professional historians um, for an hour each and, and tried to uh, kind of figure out how these historians um, think about their work, think about the, the discipline of history, think about um, all the sites and places that history work happens and how these professional historians think about communicating their work to, to people who aren't professionals. Um, and then they brought that information back to our advisory board and we wrestled with it through a few meetings and our, our team came up with a field story of history, uh, which is sort of a set of key ideas that uh, professionals try to get across to others about the work that they do. And so in that field story, we tried to capture uh, people's professionals' understandings about what history is, um, what public engagement means with, with history, um, and how what can be done to, to improve that engagement, um, and um, what can be done to, you know, what ideally would happen if the, uh, the members of the general public embraced the work of history and really kind of understood it. So that's all part of the field story. And then they went out, uh, the framework team went out and interviewed 23 Americans in three different cities, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, Frederick, Maryland, and Kansas City, Missouri. And they um, sought a diversity of, of uh, racial ethnic uh, background, um, gender, age, and socioeconomic status in that, that group of 23. And it was a small group, but they, they, they interviewed each person for two hours and did the same kind of thing, asked lots of questions about um, how they use history, how they value history, what they think history organizations do, what they think historians do. And what they're doing is looking for some commonly held assumptions or cultural models that members of the public use when they're trying to make sense of the past. Um, and so um, this is deeper than say public opinion research kind of polling. It's trying to go deeper into the cultural models that uh, you know, the linguistic models, the cultural models that, that people use to organize their thoughts about history and to um, figure out what the um, sort of cultural shortcut, co cognitive shortcuts, excuse me, cognitive shortcuts that people use for, for understanding terms that are unfamiliar to them, particularly terms having to do with history. So once the frameworks team mapped the gaps between how professionals and members of the general public talk about the past, then they outlined a set of, of challenges that uh, from the start of this project that we know we have to face. And so these include um, challenges such as the public thinks of history simply as a series of chronological events driven by actions of key individuals. And, and these challenges should sound very familiar to you because these are, these are things that um, you know, come up in teaching, come up in uh, research work, come up in getting grants, um, you know, the times that we have to uh, maybe face the public more and uh, talk to political leaders about getting funding or talking to foundations, these should all be um, sort of challenges that that sound familiar to you. So the first one is, you know, that there's that history is just simply chronologically driven, and and it's all about key individuals, you know, big men in history kind of thing. Um, second challenge is that the public believes that history is about recording and documenting just the facts. Um, so it, there was the sense that historians are, are are like journalists who are out just to record what actually happened. Um, not to inject any of their own opinion or interpretation into it, what they're finding. Um, the third challenge was that people can't tell the difference between rigorous analysis and personal opinion. Um, the fourth was that people think that learning about the past means absorbing facts and figures. The next one is there's a belief among the general public that uh, mainstream, meaning uh, typically white male historical narratives are the default and that every that everyone has to learn or should learn and that while there are narr other narratives of uh, say of historically oppressed peoples 
you know, those are extra and they're, they're not for everyone, um, that they're not mainstream. They don't have to be, um, they don't have to be learned or paid attention to. And then another challenge was that many members of the public are reluctant to learn or talk about painful or troubling things that happened in the past, particularly to historically oppressed groups. Um, the next challenge, I think the seventh challenge was that the public sees history as a non-essential hobby. And then lastly, people are very fatalistic about the possibility of ever improving how history is taught in schools in particular. So these again should sound familiar. These are just, um, these are, are sort of um, places where communication between professional historians, practicing historians and the general public often happens. So again, that's why they should sound familiar. Um, the research team also then identified some initial recommendations based on these challenges. So these are, these are opportunities and they came up with five opportunities. So the first one is that there's some understanding among the public that knowing history helps society learn from past mistakes. So we must use concrete examples of society learning from past mistakes, be explicit that societal progress takes time and involves participation by everyone and focus on positive examples of society learning so as to avoid fatalism. And then the second opportunity is that the public can sometimes see how a shared understanding of the past creates a larger sense of belonging to a community and to society. So we as historians should talk about what is shared by society and be as inclusive as possible. Um, th third opportunity here is that people sometimes recognize that the more perspectives on the past are available, the better it will be understood. So we should provide examples of how historians have come to more accurate understandings of the past by combining diverse sources of evidence. And this will likely reinforce people's existing, albeit vague sense that multiple perspectives on the past can help us understand it better. And we should explain that historians critically evaluate different perspectives in developing a fuller picture of the past. But we should emphasize the need to evaluate the different perspectives to help keep both sidisms at bay. That is, we should emphasize not that there are just different perspectives, but that some hold up under scrutiny and others just don't. And then the fourth opportunity is the public has some understanding of the power dynamics involved in discourses about the past. So some members of the public, particularly people of color, notice that the powerful, say historically white men are disproportionately featured in accounts of the past. In this view, people understand that certain perspectives such as those of people of color and women have been ignored or forgotten when talking about the past. And they believe this makes the historical record less accurate or truthful. So we have to be explicit, explicit that the role of historians is to help ensure that voices and perspectives of historically oppressed groups are heard across society. And then the, the last opportunity is that the public has a surface level understanding of the importance of museums and historical sites. And if expanded, this surface level understanding can help build support for increased funding for museums and historical sites. However, people need a deeper understanding of how these institutions support public learning and more direct forms of engagement with history. Otherwise, this way of thinking can lead to a consumerist approach to history as something those who are interested can passively absorb just by being there, just by showing up. And so to take advantage of this opportunity, we have to emphasize that museums and historical sites offer new ways of thinking about and making sense of the past rather than just presenting artifacts and information about the past. And we should be careful to avoid presenting museums and historical sites as entertainment venues, because this will likely trigger unproductive thinking about history as something to be passively consumed. So, so that's all part of the descriptive phase of the project. Right now, our researchers are working on the prescriptive research, um, and they're trying to identify specific communications tasks and strategies that will work to accomplish these, these, the goals I laid out and, and take advantage of the opportunities. So the frameworks researchers came back to us with a, with a broad set of tasks 
and then ASLH and OAH and NCPH participants, um, advisors to the project, gave them feedback and we narrowed it down um, to the following tasks. So we're gonna counter, what well, we want this project to do, the communication tools that we get out of it, the reframing tools, we wanna be able to counter public thinking about bias in historians' work. You know, not, not that there is no bias in historians' work, but that it can't, you can't just toss out or set aside a, a historian's work because there is some bias in it, a little bit of bias. Um, we want to deepen the public's understanding of what learning about history involves and of the value and role of critical thinking about the past. And then we also want to build public support for creating a shared history of the US that allows for diverse voices to be heard. We want to build understanding of the value of history for social cohesion and democratic participation. We want to build a sense of collective responsibility to learn about and engage with history. And, and so this is sort of, this is akin to a civic responsibility that everyone has. It's not, not just history professionals, but there's a collective responsibility as a society to learn about and engage with history. And then lastly, build a sense of collective efficacy around public engagement with history. So that, you know, if there are things that are not working well, say say K through 12 education or, or that's a big thing, but uh, that, that, there, that these things can be changed and they can be made better. Uh, so next, the frameworks researchers uh, developed some initial frame candidates um, or explanatory metaphors, I guess, that will help achieve these tasks. And so right now, uh, well, they, they presented these metaphors to us, to the, to the advisors. Um, we gave them feedback. Um, we looked at the metaphors um, to see if they were apt, to see if they were, you know, if they would accurately communicate um, the key issues that, that are involved in history and its value that we think it has. Um, and if these metaphors were plausible, that is, could we as history professionals, as, um, you know, historic site workers, uh, someone teaching at a university or college, um, you know, would historians actually use these metaphors to um, describe their work? So are they apt and are they plausible? So they, they gave us, a, a, I don't know, maybe 12 different metaphors. Um, we, we suggested that they focus on just a few of those. Um, one of the metaphors was, um, uh, was about history work as map making, that in the same way you make sense of the past or, or in a similar way to making sense of the past, um, you, you, one draws maps. So maps are drawn by bringing together many different sources of information about the nature of different terrains, the types of places and roads that connect them. And then this way historians rely on many different sources of evidence to situate past events and identify how they are connected to each other. And I, I like this metaphor in particular because there's also um, a, a usefulness to maps. You don't just create them to look at them, but you use them to guide. And so it, it speaks to the relevance of history and how history can be used to, um, should be used um, in, in solving today's problems and pointing to the future. Um, another of the metaphors was that making sense of the past is like uh, processing raw materials. So to have purpose in our lives, raw materials like iron or clay need to be processed with the most effective tools and technologies. And in the same way, the events, dates, and objects from the past need to be processed and interpreted with the appropriate methods and strategies. And then this is what historians do. They extract meaning out of raw materials of the past as they process them and bring out why they are relevant to us today. So they had... As I said, they had about a dozen of these metaphors. We narrowed it down to, I think, four or five. Um, and so then the frameworks researchers uh, started conducting um, on the screen interviews that were initially meant to be you know, person on the street kind of interviews. Uh, but because of the pandemic, they had to be done through Zoom. Um, but that turned out to be a real benefit because the frameworks researchers were able to record all these interviews. And something that's really interesting in them, um, these are, I think, 90 minute interviews as the, the researchers sort of test out these metaphorical framing devices. And 
something they noticed afterwards they weren't necessarily expecting to find is that um, the people being interviewed, um, you know, in the first first part of the interview, in the first 15, 20 minutes kind of said lots of different things um, about history and, um, you know, some of it perhaps pretty misinformed. But then as the, inter as the interviewers introduced these framing devices, these metaphors, by the end of the interview, you could see these shifts had already started to happen and, and the, the, the interviewees um, in the way that they were talking about history, just very subtly um, starting to accept some of these, um, uh, some of these opportunities and, and challenges I laid out. That, um, so in other words, even before the projects, uh, even without actual finished framing devices, we can begin to see the, the power of them. Uh, so what's gonna happen next and, and what Frameworks is working on right now is testing um, these, these framing devices, these metaphors um, and some language that goes along with them, some phrases, some sentences, particular words. They're gonna be testing all that in a nationally representative quantitative survey. Um, and then they're gonna be bringing back those findings to us um, later this spring um, hopefully set so that by this summer, we will be able to um, um, land on what the final um, framing devices will be, communication tools will be, and then they will take those out one more time and they will test those in uh, um, focus groups of, of, uh, of um, members of the general public. So, and then after all of that, they will bring back to us, help work with us um, to develop webinars, um, workshops, um, toolkits uh, for historians, museum workers, um, public historians of all kinds to use these, uh, what we hope is a, is a very um, focused and um, um, simple, relatively simple, um, set of linguistic framing devices, communication tools to, to uh, talk differently about the work that historians do and why it's important and how it happens. Um, so the project should be, um, we should be uh, sharing these tools uh, by fall, um, certainly by winter time, I would think. And that's where we are with our project. Great, thank you so much. Um, Peter, do you wanna go ahead and, and share a little bit about your project? Sure. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here and hide behind a PowerPoint. Um, and I'll say at the outset that of, of these three projects, the project that you're gonna hear about today, the project that I'm co-directing is by far the least developed at this point. I make no bones about that. Um, John and Rob, they already have reports written about <laughs> um, their projects. Um, my project, we're still a long ways away from that. So um, let me just tell you a little bit about you know, what we did um, and show you some things that, that I hope are of interest to you. Um, okay, so first let me tell you about um, people who are involved in this. Uh, you may recognize Jim and Dana from AHA. Uh, they've been with us from the beginning um, with this developing what, what is a national survey that we ran. And we just got the um, results uh, not too long ago. So we're still working through the results. There's all sorts of dissonance, contradictions. We are still just trying to figure out what we've got. Um, and uh, today I'm just gonna show you a, a few data points. Um, me on the left, and then uh, Krista Jenkins, she um, recently, up until recently, she was a um, political scientist with me at Fairleigh Dickinson, and she's our polling expert. She ran our university's poll for years and years, but um, she left not too long ago, and now she works with um, Pew Charitable Trust. So um, this is, we're the co-directors here, but we've received help from lots of other people as well. 
and I do want to acknowledge that um, very generous funding and support that we've gotten along the way from uh, the NEH. So what we did is, as I said, we ran a survey and, you know, initially we were thinking about running a survey, which by and large um, kind of replicated what um, Roy Rosenzweig and David Thielen did back in the 1990s. Um, and they published um, on their survey in uh, their book, The Presence of the Past. Um, and we figured we'd make some changes, but we convened an advisory committee and then we ran a series of focus groups. And as we talked with a lot of people who were involved with history in one capacity or another, maybe they're um, university professors, maybe they're K through 12 educators, museum workers, site interpreters, um, a very broad swath of people. And the more we got into this, the more we kind of diverged uh, in a lot of ways from what Rosenzweig and Thielen uh, had done, but we listened to uh, what a lot of people had to say and what they wanted to know about the public that they interact with, and then you know developed a survey to try to gather data on those issues. Um, so what we did here is we ran uh, what's called an online probability panel. Um, this is called Knowledge Panel, administered by Ipsos, uh, and we had eighteen hundred sixteen. Um, respondents at Ipsos uh, can, um, they find out what you want to do and they will select the demographic demographics based on, you know, what sort of group you're targeting. So in our case, we were trying to get a very broad swath of the American public. We asked about 40 questions. They were mostly closed questions. Um, we had a couple open-ended questions, but we still haven't gone through and, and um, coded those. Uh, and we can cross tab these in about a zillion different ways. So um, I've been working on that. Krista has two um, running cross tabs and I'm just gonna share a, a few of those, but there are literally thousands and thousands of ways that you could cross reference all of this uh, data and see what's, uh, what's important. Okay, so today I'm just gonna go through some brief findings, uh, just a few selections uh, that may corroborate, or sometimes maybe they contradict what um, Rob and John have. It's just kind of nature of the business. So before I share those with you, I'd like to try to run a survey with you people. Um, and this is one on what is, uh, what is history. So there you've got the pop up there and it says, which of the following best describes what you think the term history means? So is it, you know, names, dates, facts? Is it what people remember? Is it an explanation? Is it what historians have concluded? Uh, or is it something else? So um, choose whatever you think is, is the best response there and, and we'll see what we get. I assume it's running because I can't see results coming in. I was going to ask you exactly that because yeah, Victor, is it running? <laughs> he says it is. So cool. Okay, we got given it about thirty more seconds. Okay, so there we go. You guys can see the results there? Yeah, um, nobody chose names, dates, and other facts. Uh, you know, given the people who would come to a panel like this, I guess I'm not too surprised. <laughs> I'm also not very surprised that um, a majority of people chose explanation of experiences of the past. So I think you could justify any of these responses. 
But um, this might indicate, you know, once you see the um, results from the survey, that maybe there's a bit of a disconnect between the way that people at an age and a panel would answer this and the way that the general public would. So let me close this. I'll bring this back up. Um, let's see. Zip. Yeah, so there's our question. And when we did this in the survey, this is what we got. Um, so you can see in the blue there, 66% of the general public did in fact choose names, dates, other facts, very much what, what um, John was finding uh, in his studies. Only you know, a small minority, 17% of the general public was um, in agreement with what you know, um, this group here said. Peter, I, Peter, I think we lost your screen. We're, uh, oh, you lost my screen? Okay, geez. If you could reshare that. Yeah, wait, I, I, I did do that, sorry. All right, let me bring this back up. All right, yeah, I, I forgot to hit share screen, I just brought it up. Yeah, okay. Um, let's see, where did my numbers go? Oh, for some reason, huh, the numbers aren't appearing on this one. Uh, they appear on my, <laughs> my PowerPoint. Anyway, the blue here, this is the names, dates, and other facts. That's, that's 66%. Um, the general public is seeing um, history that way. Whereas the gray here, which is what most people um, just answer the explanation of experiences in the past, that's only a, a, a small minority. So um, that's probably not terribly surprising, you know, especially given what John said, but um, it, it's, once again, setting a, a baseline for um, this disconnect that may be happening between you know, professionals um, and non-professionals. Um, then if we break that down a little bit by age group here, um, some cross tabs and you know, we start to see some interesting things. Um, now you might have to get kind of close to your screen here to see all of this, I apologize for that but we can see that um, the blue is the 18 to 29 cohort, orange 30 to 49, gray 50 to 64, and yellow 65 plus. And you can see over here on the left that names, dates, and facts, majority of people in all the cohorts selected that. But there are some you know, sizable differences. It looks like the younger you are, the more likely you are to um, not ascribe to this uh, that particular um, view of history, at least relative to the other uh, age groups. And if you go over to explanations of the past, which is what people here selected, um, it, the reverse is true. So younger cohort is, is um, you know, more likely to be saying, uh, agreeing with that version of um, history. Now, again, that's still um, a minority uh, of the population. Uh, and you know, what does it suggest? Is this a function of the educational system? Uh, is it that the way that history is being taught now is teaching people that, well, it's more of an explanation than simply um, mastery of a bunch of facts? Um, you know, hard to tell at this point, but um, that's, you know, a possible hypothesis here. Um, if we move on, and we take a look at this from another cross tab, and that is party ID. Um, and you can see the way that it shakes out here. Uh, we got blue is Democrat, um, orange Republican, uh, gray independent, and yellow no preference. Uh, and we're seeing some pretty sizable differences. Now over on the left, the names, dates, in fact, we're still seeing that that's, you know, all parties um, are selecting that, the majority. But um, whereas, you know, um, Democrats, independents, no preferences are kind of clustered here a little bit. We can see the Republicans are, are much more likely to see the past is simply, um, you know, name states, facts. And then the reverse is true when we go over to something like explanations uh, of the past, which again is a minority response for, for all groups, uh, but that, um, that trend continues there. Uh, let's see. And then if we take a look at, um, I'm sorry, go-to sources of history. One of the uh, questions we asked was, um, you know, COVID was going on and we knew that that was going to be a, a factor. So 
we asked, you know, thinking back to January 2019, did you do any of the following activities to learn about events in the past? And we gave a, a big list of things and just said, did, did you do it or not? And then um, we put these into rank order. And again, you may have to get kind of close to your screen here. These are all percentages of these various activities, but um, you know, the, the top three most um, popular ways of finding out about the past all involve you know, film or television in one sense or another. So this could definitely be an artifact of COVID. You know, I, I know I'm watching a lot more TV as well too. Um, and then, you know, some other things, uh, such things as um, historic site visits or museum visits are, are maybe understandably, or especially museum visits are understandably, you know, down to what they might otherwise be um, under non-COVID um, circumstances. Um, but, uh, you know, college courses, not many in our, in our college, in our demographic, were doing that. Um, but uh, we'll have to, you know, look at this and, and parse it out. Uh, Wikipedia is kind of a go-to place for people to find out about the past, um, although non-Wikipedia sites seem to be beating them out uh, to a certain extent there. Um, and then if we take a look at sources that spurred people's interests in history, um, our question asks, you know, how much did each of these make you want to learn more about history? Um, and again, you might have to get kind of close here, but blue is a great deal, orange some, gray just a little, yellow not at all, and put these into you know most popular um, to to least. And what's kind of surprised everybody who's seen these data so far, and it hasn't been very many people, is that religious documents came out on, on the top. Um, now maybe that shouldn't be surprising, but you know we'll have to. Um, you know, think about what's going on there exactly. But, uh, you know, that's number one answer there. Um, site visits too uh, were way up there. And you may recall that um, in the previous, um, in the previous slide there, you know, people were watching a lot of TV and that's how they were finding out about the past. But some of those things down here, like TV news and then fictional film, TV online programs, that are, are, are not really uh, spurring people to um, want to know more. So there's a bit of an, an inversion there uh, to be sure. Um, and finally, and this is one where, you know, this is kind of an ode to Rosenzweig and Thielen's um, work where they, they asked people about trustworthiness of various, various sources of the past. And we expanded the um, possible list of sources here to see how accurate people um, viewed these various sources. Uh, the color scheme is the same, great deal, some just a little or not at all. And like Rosen, Zweig, and Thielen had found in the 90s, museums are at the top. Um, and I've run flash polls in my classes and everything, and people always choose museums as <laughs> the most trustworthy um, for, for various reasons. Historic sites, you know, are not um, far behind them. Uh, professors have, you know, we're doing fairly well here. The number four, I guess, ain't bad. Um, but we get down to some other things, uh, again, some, you know, fictional TV, TV news uh, towards the bottom. These are just not seen as very trustworthy, even though, again, this is where a lot of people are going to, to find out about the past. So they're going to these things and yet they don't, they don't trust them. Um, and interesting too, you know, fictional films and TV and then social media and, and video games being so low, we asked another question, I'm not gonna show you the data on that, where people were saying that they feel they learn much better when history is presented as entertainment. Um, so these things I would probably equate, equate more with entertainment and yet they're, you know, the general public isn't seeing them as very trustworthy. So uh, we'll have to work through that. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, and then finally, um, you know, history is a celebration of, of the nation's past. We asked some questions about this and we, we asked a bunch of what we call um, paired choice questions where people had to select an answer even though, you know, they may not necessarily like either one to keep them from punting and just having no opinion. Uh, and this question was, you know, which comes closer to your own views on history in the nation's past and the pie chart comes up pretty evenly split between whether history should be a celebration of the nation's past 
or whether history should question the nation's past. So maybe, you know, that's not too surprising, I don't know, uh, to be pretty evenly split. But things do get interesting when we go to some cross tabs. For instance, again, if we look at it in terms of party ID, and I don't mean to suggest party ID is, is always um, uh, you know, off between the various parties. A lot of times it's not, but on, on these, you know, it tended to be uh, pretty different here. And on the left, we got should celebrate the nation's past. On the right, should question nation's past. Self-ID Democrats, blue, Republican, red, green, independent, purple, no preference. Um, and we can see that independent, no preference are, are pretty much coming in 50-50. Um, but Democrats and Republicans, you know, maybe, maybe not surprisingly, I don't know, um, are, are really on opposite sides uh, of this particular issue. Um, and it's not just a um, party ID issue. If we take a look at the same uh, question in terms of race and ethnicity. And here we've got blue is white, red, black, green, Hispanic, purple, two plus races, and blue, other. Um, and Hispanic, two plus races, and other, again, are pretty close to that 50 50 split whether history should celebrate or question. But again, it, Democrats and Republicans really seem to be coming at this uh, from very different angles here. So um, yeah, so that, those are just a, a couple data points. Uh, we got plenty more that are coming. Um, we're in the process of you know, still going through a lot of data. Uh, we'll eventually be writing up a report and that will be made available on the AHA website. And we are going to post the raw data uh, on the AHA website, I think in like SPSS format. So if you're, if you know SPSS, I think you're in luck. If not, I'm um, not so sure. Um, but in that way, you know, you can go through and run your own cross tabs and, and see what, um, what you make about this information as well. So... That's that. Great. Thank you so much. That's really interesting. Um, Rob, you want to go ahead with your study? Great. Thanks, Kari. I will also share. There we go. So if you can, if you're seeing the screen there. Uh, I, I, I feel obliged at the beginning also to, to thank the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, which uh, was critical in, in funding this. They not only funded the administration, they funded two years of actual development of the survey. So, uh, you know, as, as with so many things, the Mellon Foundation is just a critical, critical friend to, to all of us who are involved in the, uh, in the humanities here. Um, well, let me see, maybe I'm not sharing the right screen here. Make sure I'm sharing the right one. Is that right? So you're seeing the slides. Um, let's see. So just to give you a sense of, of kind of, so unlike the other two surveys, our survey was actually developed. It was developed because I, I'd always wanted to do something that would be like the uh, Rosenzweig Thielen survey, because um, Roy was my dissertation advisor. Uh, so I had a, a, a connection. Uh, a deep connection to, to that sort of activity. But since I'm working for the humanities indicators, we want to develop a survey about the humanities, uh, broadly speaking. And one of the initial challenges we found it, when we started to ask questions about it was that we discovered that the humanities, there, if you ask the public about the humanities, you get a lot of different answers about what the, the word humanities actually means. And so history is obviously a part of it, but it was, you know, there's a lot of people who align the humanities with art. Uh, but also a lot of people who align it with things like giving blood and doing donations. So you get a lot of very varied things, not many of which, uh, some of which would in no way be what we think of as the humanities. So we developed a survey that was sort of worked through a, a, a very specific approach to how we sort of snuck up on people to ask about the humanities. So we started by asking about types of engagement. We talked about uh, their activities with uh, things as children uh, and in the workplace. 
And it was only really after we'd laid out things that we think of as the humanities, I think perhaps since this is more of an academic audience, perhaps not things you would think of as the humanities, but it fits with a very expansive scope uh, for our purposes uh, and with a very publicly, a public facing view of what the humanities is. Uh, so we, we laid that out and it was only sort of towards the end that we actually introduced the word humanities as a, a specific term of art, asking people, you know, and, and describing it as studying, both pointing back to the, the things that we had already asked about, but then, uh, you know, describing it specifically or, or defining it as studying or participating in activities related to literature, languages, history, and philosophy. And it was only then that we then asked some specific questions about whether they agreed with positive and negative statements about the humanities, uh, talked about different uh, subjects that they might have wished they had studied, and then attitudes about specific terms. So uh, that was really how we, we set it up. And just to give you a quick sense of how we conducted this, the, the survey. So we, we sat down, much like John, uh, we sat down with uh, 25 folks. We read them the survey. We asked them uh, for their responses to the survey and really listened to how they, um, what, what they were hearing as they were hearing the, 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 the wording of the questions and also gave us a sense of what, how the, and why they responded in the way they did. Um, and then we tweaked the survey instrument a little bit and then we used the National Opinion Research Center's uh, Amerispeak panel, which is similar to the Ipsos poll that, that Peter talked about, uh, to, which is a nationally representative uh, slice of, of uh, the American population that is, has a, a kind of a, 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 they have an incentive system to get, a, uh, get people to fill out their survey and to make sure that it's uh, nationally representative and to address some of the problems that we saw in the polling for the last election, which are based much more on sort of random, random dial sample surveys where you get like a 1% or 2% response rate if you're lucky. This is based on a sort of built, constructing a, a, a unit of, of the population and then uh, sort of that you already know about and then asking them questions to, to try and avoid some of the problems that, that came up there. So I won't talk uh, uh, much about the, the humanity side of that. Um, I encourage you to go online and, and look at the, uh, the materials we push there. I just want to focus specifically on history. And you know, starting at the beginning, just in terms of the engagement activities, I think one of the, the surprises that came out right from the get-go for us is that when you juxtapose uh, the, the variety of different sort of hum humanistic activities that we presented people with, uh, as you can see, the by the the darker colors, history really rose to the top in terms of the the various activities that we gave them. In terms of the dark green lines showing you people who uh, who thought who engaged in these different activities very often or often, uh, and similar to to what Peter described, watching shows with historical content was the most popular activity that uh, that came up in. Term, in, in terms of frequency of activity, um, where we, we got almost half the population saying that they uh, were watching shows with historical content. Uh, and you know, we talked about the History Channel, we talked about PBS. So again, for an academic audience, we could, I'm sure we could debate whether uh, they truly understood what historical content was. Although I must say the percentages are very close to what uh, the AHA got in their survey, which I found quite validating. But then, uh, then uh, researching the history of something of interest in their lives came in third, just below fiction reading in terms of the percentage of people who said they often engage in these things. And then you see towards the bottom, visiting a history museum or, or historic site, got a fairly small percentage of people who said they do it very, very often or often. Um, but, you know, it, it's still slightly more than half who said they do it at least sometimes. Uh, and in terms of the, the various activities that we gave them, it's very close to say to, to going to art museums and a variety of other activities that involve going outside uh, that, that had uh, much frequency. So, um, so that, that was particularly surprising to us. And then in terms of thinking about where our, our readers are, um, as you can see, nonfiction reading was slightly lower in terms of the percentage of, uh, of uh, people who said they did it fairly often and you know basically less than a third 
of the population say they're doing it often or very often. Uh, for our purposes, we didn't want to get into the distinction between biography, history, or any other sorts of cultural analysis because, uh, like you know, we're, we wanted to focus on the humanities broadly. But I think it gives you some sense that the the universe of nonfiction readers out there is is actually relatively small in in uh, in in the terms that uh, that we might be interested in. One of the other surprises for us was, you know, to the extent that I think about the humanities as a somewhat unified concept is that when we sort of you think about it as a Venn diagram about these various activities, the, there was not a lot of overlap between the various activities, uh, even within the discipline. So for history, the people who watch history shows were not significantly more likely to be the sort of the, the same people who also spend time doing research on history subjects online. And similarly, the history show watchers weren't a whole lot more likely to be going to historic sites or reading nonfiction. There was a lot of, I mean, it was a, a very, uh, there was a lot of disparity between these different areas of activity and they tended to be much more aligned along the mode of activity than the actual, uh, uh, the actual content at least in the way that we would think of it. So the, the show watchers, people who watch history shows were also more likely to watch other shows with other humanities content. And the fiction readers tended to also be nonfiction readers. Uh, and they tend to be much more clustered along those lines than in the uh, either it, under the umbrella of the uh, sort of a broad umbrella of humanities activities or a more narrow um, umbrella of the sort of disciplinary activities that we might think of as, as historians. So that, that was a particularly surprising takeaway for us. Um, but on the positive side for, for those of us in team history um, was that when we ask about people's attitudes towards specific terms, history came out very near the top. And I mean, from a, st st a statistical point of view, history and science were almost indistinguishable in terms of the share of the population that had a favorable attitude towards, um, towards it. And uh, you know, you got 48% of the population that have a very favorable attitude, 90% uh, who had at least a favorable, somewhat, at least a somewhat favorable attitude towards history as a term, uh, which put it right on par with science and, and well above a lot of the other uh, humanities uh, sort of questions, even certainly the, the, the term humanities itself. And I, I guess in part because we're all thinking about politics these days, I also, sort of looked at some of the deeper cuts in terms of political, we, we asked about ideological self-identification. Uh, and so the, the splits, one of the, the, the recurring themes that came up in a lot of the, resp the responses to the different questions we had was that history was always kind of alone in terms of having a, a more positive uh, attitude from conservatives than most other groups of, uh, of respondents. So in terms of the, the basic question, just looking specifically at the people who gave, had a very favorable attitude, you can see liberals and conservatives in orange, uh, you know, in, in looking at specifically at the orange, liberals and conservatives had basically the same, uh, the same share of them uh, who had a, a very favorable attitude and at slightly more than a majority uh, who had a very favorable attitude towards the word history uh, and which was set it significantly apart from the response say to the word humanities where you had a clear distinction between liberals and conservatives in terms of their their favor their sort of favorable view of uh, humanities as a term that the contrast is really quite striking uh, one of the other questions we asked about is you know looking back on your at your educations what subjects do you wish you had taken more uh, courses in while you were you were, uh, you know during the course of your studies so if, if they were in college, then you know, we could parse out the, the, the college goers uh, from the, the, uh, the people that finished with a you know, without a college degree. Um, this sort of lumps them all together. And as you can see, I mean, the one su big surprise for us was that languages other than English popped to the top in terms of the subjects people wish they had taken more courses in with basically a majority, near majority of the population wishing they had taken more classes in languages. But world history and American history came up fairly close to the top, each getting about a third of the population saying they wish they had taken more courses in those subjects. And when you aggregate those two together, uh, you know, and just 
cluster the people who said history e in either form, it, you get 42% of the population, which as you can see, basically puts it, would put it in, in the three spot between computer science and the social and behavioral sciences as subjects that people wish they had taken more of when they were in school. And once again, the liberal conservative splits on this um, was particularly striking. The, in terms of the, um, if you look here, the in blue American history, only 30% of people that define themselves as liberal wish they had taken more courses in American history as compared to 43% of, uh, of conservatives who wish they had taken more courses in American history. Whereas the world history split was pretty much even right at uh, 39% in terms of the population. And the splits as you perhaps unsurprisingly, I, I included gender history, uh, gender studies as a, another uh, subject, as you can see, you know, while 19% of the liberals wish they had taken more in that subject, we basically get more almost a rounding error in terms of uh, conservatives wishing they had taken more gender studies. Um, and philosophy is similar. You get a, 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 a much greater gap between liberals and conservatives on the, the shares that wish they had taken more courses in those subjects. So again, the, the, the attitudes, the, the distinctions between liberals and conservatives in their attitudes towards history was really striking when we look at it in relationship to the broad, to a variety of other uh, humanistic uh, subjects and activities across most of the questions that we had had. And it, it really stood out in, in our more comparative analysis. Uh, one of the other questions we'd asked is just how important uh, adults think it is for children to learn different subjects. And as you can see, you know, reading and writing, obviously you get most of the population who, uh, who think that it's important for, for kids to learn about those things. But American history, uh, you know, comes up again, fairly high. You got 85% of the population who wish that they had uh, taken a, uh, who think that it's important for children to learn uh, in the schools. World history and cultures, 80%. So again, doing, uh, you know, showing a, a high representation of, uh, of interest in those uh, subject fields and potentially something that we could build on as, a, uh, as part of the case for, for history uh, more broadly. And finally, we asked some questions about how people were using different humanistic skills on the job. Uh, and as part of the development process, Jim Grossman uh, appealed to me to include something about history as a, um, as a potential skill area. And as you can see in that context, uh, history did not do particularly well in terms of the, the share of people who say that they're, they're using, uh, they're either doing historical research or applying a historical perspective. Only 14% said they were doing it very often or often and 20% said they, they did so sometimes. And we had a separate question that asked, you know, did you, do you feel like you were limited in your job and uh, on that one, history came in flat at the bottom and about the same percentage of people who said that they uh, felt like uh, their inability to engage in, in uh, or to, to do things like historical research and per historical perspective uh, had, uh, had impeded their, their work. Most said that either they didn't need to use it at, at work or that uh, they just in no way felt limited when, it, when they needed to use it. So uh, from that perspective, and to the extent that the connection between jobs and majors is something that keeps coming up, uh, we didn't, we weren't able to provide a lot of uh, constructive uh, data there. So, uh, with that, I will um, encourage you to go and look at the the larger report, which is free on uh, the academy's website. And I will turn it back to Karen for any other questions you might have. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Rob. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and get us started on the questions, but I wanna again, invite everybody to use that Q&A tab to submit questions of your own. Um, while I, I start with a question for the panelists, I'd also like to ask Victor, I, I rather unfairly to him, uh, asked him about 15 minutes ago to put together a little poll as we were going along for all of you to, to fill out. So if, Victor, if you want to put that poll up, um, then while you do that, I'll begin the conversation. But I would just love to get a sense of where people in the room work. So um, 
forgive the rough categories, it was sort of spur of the moment, uh, answer as best you can. And if your answer is other, please do share where you work in the chat so that we have a sense of, of sort of where you're coming from. Uh, and while you go ahead and answer that, uh, I'd like to ask the panelists to uh, begin with a, a question about um, why we conduct polls like this. So one of the things that I found really striking was that, uh, John, when you were describing your poll, you also described the sort of to what end, right? When you got into uh, ways that metaphors can be used to change how people think, um, you were taking it from a, a descriptive mode to a, a more sort of active mode of, of engaging with people in surveying them. Um, I'd like to hear a little more about that. And Pete and Rob, I wonder if you have a to what end buried in there as well that you're just not sort of raising up to the surface in the same way that John is. Um, but I'd like to hear just a little bit more from all three of you about what you hope that th these kinds of tools will accomplish. Yeah, that's a, a great question. I was uh, listening to uh, Peter and Rob. I realized I should have given more of a more background on why we're doing this. I, I skipped right over that. Um, and for for me personally, it also began with presence of the past. Um, that book was very, you know, ha has been very important. Um, has spurred a lot of conversations over the last is it thirty years now almost. Um, I know it was published in 1998, but the research was happening well before that. Um, and, and there was, as powerful and, and useful as that book is, there never came out of it sort of, um, I guess, tools for moving forward for ways that um, college professors, high school history teachers, museum workers, park service employees, you know, how could you use that research to improve um, what you were trying to do every day. Um, and, and every time that book has come up in the past, it's always in conjunction with this idea, you know, one small question that they asked in there about trustworthiness and, and, and Pete pointed to that question again today, we're all fascinated by that. And I was fascinated to see that college professors have actually moved up um, <laughs> quite a bit compared to uh, 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 Rosenzweig and Phelan's book um, and there have been other studies that, you know, other other polls that have asked that question about trustworthiness and everyone, at least in the, 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 the public history realm, museum people love being able to say museums are the most trustworthy. But we wanted to, you know, we wanted to do this kind of research that would lead to um, actual, actual um, changes in behavior and the way we speak about our work that would uh, help us connect to those audiences, whether we're trying to get them in the doors of our institutions to pay an admission fee or to be good taxpayers in a community that, that are supporting, um, um, you know, the creation of a new historic site or something, or to, to better, you know, when we go walk the halls of Congress for Museums Advocacy Day or Humanities on the Hill, one of those things, what, how could we present our work um, just with a slight change of phrase that might then, oh, yes, I, I, I get that. Um, I think one of the, one of the um, early findings, um, I don't know if it was of our report or where I heard this, but um, I guess it was in the initial work in our, our project. Uh, if, you, if you get people talking about history and, and then talk about what they learned in school, often that just leads down to this cascading series of sort of cognitive jumps that they make um, to whether or not they had a good experience in high school. If they liked their history teacher, or they didn't like their history teacher. And then that shapes everything else that you're trying to discuss with them about history, whether maybe it's funding for this new museum, or maybe it's um, better funding for NEH, or it's um, just the exciting work that came out of the 1619 project or something. But if you talk about high school history, that leads to thinking about their teacher, that leads to thinking about them 
you know, whether they felt good or bad, boom. And then I think Rob found a, a similar kind of thing in, in the humanities study, and we found it in ours as well, that people, some people think that history compared to other humanities subjects contains painful topics, and therefore they don't like history, like because historians deal with slavery and the Holocaust, um, well, that, that makes history kind of an uncomfortable subject. So I, I wanna talk about something else. Um, anyway, so yeah, we went into this trying to um, come up with actionable tools that all of us can use in different settings um, and kind of use them in a unified way so that there's, there's more force. And if you're hearing your high school history teacher and then your college professor and then museum workers, all kind of saying the same things, uh, framing framing their work in similar kinds of ways that that could be really that could be really productive for the discipline of history. Thank you, um, Rob. Do you want to say something, and then maybe Pete can jump in about the ambitions for for you all? I mean, for us, when we were developing the, the humanities indicators uh, from the get go, we found that. Uh, we found that, I mean, my, my colleague, Norman Bradburn, he went around and he asked a lot of people, like, what would you like to know about the humanities? And, and it quickly became apparent that what people wanted to know tended to be, the, the data all tended to be related to higher ed. The questions that most people had was, what does the public, so, but what does the public think about us? How are we going to make the case to Congress, to our legislators uh, about the value of, of the humanities. And it was all over here in the, the question of, of, uh, of what the public actually thought about it, how they engaged with it, and, and what drove, you know, what impelled them to, to think about the humanities as being something that would be of interest to them. And so, uh, frankly, the reason that we did the survey, aside from my sort of wanting to reproduce what Roy had done, was that the Mellon Foundation, after uh, after the first attempt to, to defund the NEA, the Mellon Foundation came to me and said, so what can we do to find out more about how, what the public actually thinks about us? Because clearly, if, if you know, clearly this is a bigger problem than we thought. And, uh, and that was really the, the germ that, that led to us ultimately doing the survey. So that, that's kind of, it's kind of a process thing, but it certainly fits with a lot of the questions that we've been hearing all the way along. Yeah, I, <laughs> I just echo everything that, that Rob and John said. I guess the one thing I would add is I came to this project from a pedagogical angle insofar as in a history methods course, I'd had students you know, read Rosenzweig and feel in this presence of the past, but then their assignment is they had to go out and, and rerun the survey, um, at least you know, portions thereof. And, and we would tweak it a bit um, and add things that the students thought were interesting or change um, the original questions. And it, it, it remains a great assignment, I mean, in terms of you know, student engagement and enthusiasm and all the rest. But um, as we did it, you know, year after year, different iterations of it, it became apparent that, you know, we were getting data that um, you know, oftentimes differed from what Rosenzweig and Thielen uh, had. So, you know, the assumption was, well, okay, if it's happening on these very small scales, it's probably happening more broadly too. Um, so, you know, the goal was, it was really to uh, take another sort of national snapshot uh, and, and whenever we convened, um, you know, advisory councils or, or focus groups, and people are always very enthusiastic about um, their desire to know, you know, what does the general public think about these things? Thank you all. Um... It's a, a big, broad question, I know. Uh, and actually, I'd like to take, uh, add a follow-up, uh, take Chair's prerogative here. Um, but first, let me just say really quickly um, that the, the little survey of our audience uh, revealed that we've got about half of our audience members teach history in a university setting, 15% uh, at museums or historic sites, 15% um, at academic adjacent nonprofits. And then uh, we've got libraries and we've got 
both graduate and undergraduate students represented in our other categories. So it's it's quite a diversity of listeners. And I actually want to speak very directly to that in asking my next question of you, because I was struck uh, in listening to John's presentation and then thought more about it as I was looking at your data, Pete, and yours, Rob, um, with the question of whether it matters for some of the ambitions of your funders and maybe even of people who got involved in shaping your surveys, whether people do good history or not. So um, some of what you're, I think some of what you're getting at, John, in, in shaping how people think is how, how they think really productively and in historically minded ways. But some of the questions that are asked in these surveys have to do with um, what we might regard as, as somewhat shallow engagement. Uh, John, you talked about entertainment and how entertainment can actually be a challenge to real historical thinking if people imagine that, you know, the sort of, I don't know, ghost programming that's run sometimes under, you know, the name of history these days, um, we, you know, think that that's real history. I suppose I wonder whether um, funders or lawmakers uh, or even sometimes museum professionals are bothered about whether people are, are thinking like good historical thinkers or simply whether they're showing up. Um, and maybe there's a pathway from just showing up to being good historical thinkers. But I, I guess I wonder whether, um, whether some of what these surveys make possible is a kind of uh, approach that, that takes the lower bar rather than the higher bar. And is that a problem? Yeah, I think we're, we're definitely trying to avoid that, the taking the, the, the encouraging the lower form of participation or the superficial engagement with the past or going it the wrong way. Um, I, and I sort of have two, two responses. One is that um, across the museum and historical society world right now, um, museum people, public historians, public history practitioners, um, so not just public historians, but everyone working in museums and historic sites, historical societies, um, there is a great movement toward trying to be very transparent about the work, the historical thinking that goes on behind the scenes and trying to put that into museum labels and signs and as part of tours, mentioning the decisions that historians had to make what sources they had available, what sources they didn't have available, and why they use this artifact and not some other artifact in their collection, um, and, and to, to reveal the ways that, um, uh, be more open about the ways that uh, professionals, history professionals do their work. And that starts to get at um, what, are the, what, are the, what are the good and bad, I guess, methods and approaches, what's a good source, what's a bad source, um, so to do much more of that, um, and that's already started happening. And then I guess the other thing is that what we want to do with our with this frameworks project is it's ultimately a way of communicating that very same thing. How, what is it that historians do? What kind of training is necessary? Like without getting into all the details, um, and without trying to send a message like, oh well, we're the experts and you're not. That's not what we're trying to do. It's just like, um, the, the, it's, I think it's, a, it's apparent in all of this surveying and many other surveys that are out there that there's, there's great misunderstanding um, in the general public about what, what historical thinking is and how historians do their work. And we're simply trying to communicate in a, in a, in a few sentences or with just a metaphorical image in mind oh, this is what historians do. They're not simply standing back, recording things that happened in the past that, that, and then just accumulating those facts. And then history is the process of absorbing all those facts and figures. Like, well, that's really not helpful. That's not what we do. That's part of what we do, but it's, that's, that's not it. So um, yeah, so we, I hope we would never end up with and leading to what you were just describing, that we're going in the opposite direction. I'll be honest, we didn't. 
worry about that because uh, I think from our perspective, <laughs> we we I think early on we realized that when you try and make distinctions that would be relevant and meaningful to to academic historians, you discover that you basically can't ask questions to the general public uh, in most cases in a in a in a way that would allow you to to collect data about their engagement, and so. That's why we asked the questions the way we did, which was to ask broadly about, you know, watching show his, shows with historical content, or um, you know, or just use the specific term history, uh, or classes, because in, in a lot of cases, getting into the parsing of the positive or negative is, uh, uh, or or academic versus non-academic. I think mostly what we, I think if we'd done a survey that was specifically on the academics notion and conception of the humanities. We simply would have found that not a whole lot of people are engaging with the academics notion of uh, of the humanities, and not a whole lot of people have a particularly positive or negative view of the academics notion of history or the humanities. Uh, they just simply don't. It's not really on their radars in a way that that is meaningful for us, for those of us that have lived it. Uh, in my case, for the past thirty odd years, uh, but it is. Uh, I think. It, it gets to the, the, the problem of our ability to communicate to the general public that I think from my perspective, what we want to do is show that the, the public thinks they're engaging with history and to try and set up a conversation about the fact that we need to be engaging with more intermediaries to help them perhaps flesh out in the way that John has talked about, flesh out the concept of what history is, what it should be, what it could be, um, but that's not if you're doing a survey of the general public right now, you just there there's not a whole lot of value in, in trying to get deeper into that. Although I think the AHA did do some interesting work to try and get into some of those distinctions in a, in a more constructive way. So I'll I'll throw it to Peter. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, these surveys, you know, it's kind of the the same thing as giving a multiple choice exam as opposed to an essay exam. You know, a, a survey is you can cover a lot of stuff, but you're just not going to go very deep. So it's always just a starting point for a conversation. Um, for example, you know that um, that difference between like museums and nonfiction books, and museums are always ranked as more trustworthy than nonfiction books. Um, that's a starting point for conversations, say with my students, and and students will always see rank museums high, not so much because there are tangible objects in museums. They'll say, "Oh, we like museums because." teams of people come up with displays. So there's some sort of quality control with teams working together, at least that's their assumption. Um, but when it comes to say um, scholarly articles or books, um, their assumption is usually that I can just write anything I want and publish it and, and that's the end of it, that there isn't any sort of peer review or quality control or things like that. So um, stuff like this I think is very useful as a starting point, but um, to try to, as Rob, I think was mentioning, to try to measure that stuff in a form of a survey would, would just be really hard. You could probably do it more through like say focus groups, but you'd need a different mechanism. All right, well, I'm gonna start bringing out some of the, the questions that have come from the audience, uh, some of which actually seem like rather uh, natural segues from the conversation we were just having. Uh, so one of the audience members uh, asks whether, in fact, you think that the favorable public attitudes toward history as compared to other humanities disciplines has to do precisely with this belief that history is about names and dates, et cetera. So the idea that it's fact-based. Um, we have kind of the flip side of that with, with somebody asking about um, you know, the question of whether uh, nationalism in America is feeding some of the popularity of history. Uh, and then somebody who kind of ties all of it together and says, um, isn't the question of the popularity of history and the humanities uh, dependent on what kind of history is being taught or conveyed? So are, are some people finding it? And this is, I guess, you know, this is going to the question of popularity, but maybe also relates to some extent to what you find trustworthy or what you find methodologically valid. Um, you know, it, we've got people who might be enthusiastic about history um, who are really enthusiastic about the 1619 project. And then we've got people who think that they're really enthusiastic about history 
who are enthusiastic about Trump's Project 1776, right? And both of those people might have had the same answers to some of the questions. So I guess um, these are the questions that we're getting from, uh, from the audience. I wonder if you could speak a little bit more to that. I mean, my, my, that is my reading. I mean, my reading of it is, I mean, you know, you go to Barnes and Noble and you will see as many books by Fox News hosts as you will by academic historians, perhaps more. And so I think partially what we're seeing there is that there uh, were, that history is as prone to information bubbles as any other subject. And, but it is in some ways a common sort of, not it, it's it's well it's a uh, while both sides think they're dealing in the same uh, same playground, they're using the same term to mean two very different things, and I think that fundamentally is why you can get both liberals and conservatives giving positive responses to to history when they aren't on so many other subjects uh, because I think, and I say this from having many Trumpy family members who quote different historical I mean who don't just quote facts and dates, but who quote interpretations that I think are wrong and ridiculous in much the same way as the 1776 commission report, but who still feel like they, they know history and they are, uh, you know, that it's simply my false, my fake history is being juxtaposed with the real history that they know. And I think that's a, both a, a challenge and potentially an opportunity. I don't know whether, uh, how that, we might actually uh, affect that, but it is, uh, it does speak to why I think history actually rises above the others because unlike the others, there is sort of two realms in which, uh, which people of different, of different views can, can coexist or at least think they're coexisting. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I, oh, go ahead, Pete. Oh, well, I was gonna say, we did ask a question, I didn't share today, um, just asking people, not, you know, do you think like history is important? Because that's that's a costless choice. They usually say, yeah, in the same way that they'll say, well, we like warm, fuzzy puppies too. <laughs> but we asked them specifically, um, is history, you know, as important or less important than business and engineering? You know, saying, okay, uh, make a choice here. Vast majority said, oh, history is at least as important. I, I think it was like, you know, 85, 90%. Um, so I, I, I kind of saw that as a good news um, piece of data. On the other hand, um, you know, I haven't been following, say, uh, enrollments in, in history majors at the university level. Rob used to write about that all the time for AHA. I, I, just, I just finished the article uh, for the AHA oh, last did? night, and, and believe me, it, it will bring no joy to anyone. Yeah, I mean, my understanding is that it kind of maybe leveled out finally. Maybe it wasn't getting any worse. So, oh, it's still going down. <laughs> So it's kind of weird, um, you know, where people say, oh, okay, this is a very important, it's important for people to know about this stuff. And even compared to other more lucrative careers or something, it's important. And yet it's still not really translating to people making, you know, formal investments. Um, you know, they'll watch History Channel and things like, and that's great, that's wonderful. Um, but, you know, choosing it, say, is a career is, is still really lagging. And I don't know, given what Rob just said, maybe it's gonna lag for quite a while. I also wonder how much reading is really a big part of our problem too, because I've been tracking a decline in reading habits for at least the past eight years. I mean, the and to the extent that history is associated with reading, if it's not on television, I just I yeah, wonder I mean, whether that isn't part of the problem, the uphill battle that, that we face in trying to attract students into our classrooms if long form reading is dying or... Aram and Roxa and uh, Academically Adrift, they measured that. That came out in 2010. Humanities courses at the college level were requiring far more reading and writing than anything else. Uh, and so if you like reading and writing, you're in luck. But yeah, if you're trying to shy away from work like that, then, then you might be absolutely right, Rob. All right, I'm going to... Uh... I'm gonna go ahead and throw another question out there from the audience. Um, do any of your surveys give you a sense of how much uh, participation in the activities of conducting history, doing family research, um, various hobbies, do they change people's understanding of 
the history that they consume more passively? Do they make people like history more? Um, you know, does, does sort of rolling up your sleeves make you more inclined to have a favorable attitude toward history? I mean, in our survey, we found that people who had engaged with the humanities, who remembered engaging with the humanities with their parents uh, as children were more likely to engage with the humanities and the history to history. Uh, but I mean, we're talking about kind of small percentages there. And again, we get into the ambiguity about how people conceive of history, but, but we certainly saw a connection between the childhood engagements and the, uh, the other engagements uh, and, and later engagements. Uh, so there was, there did seem to be some correlation, but again, you get into that, that ambiguity about the different ways people engage with, uh, with different aspects of the humanities in terms of their modes. So it, it's hard to know quite how to pinpoint what those relationships are. Yeah, and ours, I mean, we did ask about um, whether people engaged in say family research, genealogy. And so that's the sort of thing that we could cross tab then with some of our other questions that we just haven't done. So, you know, that's maybe we'll do that or when we make the data available, somebody else can do it. Um, yeah, and, and our research isn't that kind of survey to figure out an answer to that question. But again, I would hope that the, the communication tools, metaphors that we come up with will help people to see people who are engaged in family history, genealogy research, or have hobbies, you know, historical reenactors or connect, collecting military artifacts or something that they begin to see, oh, I, you know, I've always thought of myself as a historian of type. I see, oh, I see how what I do is similar and different. Um, you know, just somehow without, without grabbing someone and, and, and interrogating them for, you know, 15 minutes and telling them how history is supposed to work and then have, letting them find themselves on a scale somehow, but somehow just more naturally in conversation as we talk about um, historical, you know, books or research that has come out and, and why history is important that um, people who engage with history in all different kinds of ways see themselves as part of that or where they differ from someone who has more training in a certain area. Um, and, and I think I said this before, but I wanna emphasize that I personally, and I think ASLH is not interested in trying to set experts aside from everyone else and say, well, to be an expert, you have to have a master's degree or you have to have a PhD. It, it's very much of a spectrum. That's all kind of on a, on a circle, the ends are connected. Um, you know, there are people who are engaged in family history research or who are volunteers at a local historical society that have you know, vast amounts of knowledge and very sophisticated approaches to what they're doing and are very excited about what they're doing. And uh, you know, college faculty could learn a lot from them. So this is, this is more about trying to find what is the, what is the alchemist stone, I guess, that will, um, I don't know, that's not the right word. What is the, what is the magical talisman that will, that um, when it enters a conversation, people will just say, ah, okay, I understand what you're doing and I see that it's um, similar to things that I value and, and I, I can understand that. So like, I, I think the closest, the metaphor that worked the best for me personally was um, thinking of, and this is a common one, a lot of college professors have used in the classroom and teachers have used, that doing history is doing detective work. So not all evidence is equal. When you go out, you don't just go with the first fact you find on, on internet, you know, on, on Wikipedia to, um, to solve a murder case. Like you look at all the evidence and you have lots of different kinds of evidence. It's not all written down. Some of it's physical evidence. Um, you might interview people, oral history. So, you know, that seems like that's a potentially powerful one if we can figure out what are the, what are the words and phrases associated with doing detective work that if we sprinkle that into how we historians talk about a work that most of the general public would be, oh, I understand that. I love this idea of metaphors. I think, you know, most of us have had situations where we struggled to explain what it is we do as a job and why it's a job to people at a, a party who do something that feels much more concrete. And so I think this is really helpful uh, for yeah. those of us who are looking to engage. 
that, that reminds me, um, one of the, in, 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 in the early conversations, interviews with members of the general public, the research frameworks researchers found that there was a lot of gravitation towards this idea of historians as journalists, just collecting facts. And that's, that's problematic for that reason, but also because of the present moment we've been in for the last several years of the media being under such attack and the idea that, oh, any journalist automatically has a, a bias that, um, you know, I don't really, in, in, in the, the, the charts that uh, Rob and Pete were showing, uh, you know, the news media ranks very low in trustworthiness. And so, you know, that's, that's another, you know, talking about our work as being like journalists, you know, we take the, the journalists take the first pass at history and then historians finish it off. That could be problematic in this moment we're in because journalists just aren't trusted. And do we, do we as historians want to be connected to that? Right. Problematic probably for both communities actually yeah. too, it should be said. Um, all right, we are down to our last couple of minutes here. Um, so I'm gonna throw out one that I think we can get a, I think we can get a quick consensus on, which is uh, somebody has asked if other disciplines are concerned about similar kinds of issues. Um, and uh, my feeling is yes, they are, but I'd love to get I mean, my sense is across the humanities, actually, that, you know, there, this feels like a moment to try to figure out how people can, in academic disciplines, can better engage their publics. But I'd be glad to hear if, if you guys have similar senses from your colleagues from other disciplines. I have to say, take up for, for our, our survey has been really strong across most disciplines in terms of, uh, so I can... And they were actively engaged in the development process in, in a wide variety of different formats. So I, I can I can certainly say the the other disciplines seem as, as keenly engaged as as the as history is in these questions for sure. I, I haven't been reading you know literature on this sort of stuff in other disciplines. Although any of my colleagues in other disciplines that I talk with about this say, oh that's so cool. We should really be doing that in our discipline too. <laughs> so you know. Um, I think there's great interest, especially in the, the disciplines that uh, in a university that really seem to be having enrollment problems. It's, uh, you know, kind of, okay, let's figure out what's going on here and how can we better, you know, engage the public. And then I want to end with a question that I hope gives us an opportunity to end on an optimistic note. Um, we have a question about how digitization of history might increase public access, public engagement, and help to shape ideas about history. Uh, any parting thoughts on, on that, on broadening access? Um, I, I think one consequence of, of increased access to history through digital, digital means is that um, more, the general public will have a much more, already has a much more interdisciplinary notion of what history is than a lot of trained historians do perhaps, that trained historians are for, for a long time have been um, trained to focus on, on the written word and written documents and maybe photographs just beyond that. Um, and, and that certainly has changed a lot probably in the last 10 or 15 years of, of using material culture and oral history well, for longer than that, I guess. But I think when you come to history through digital means, you're instantly connected to you know, chemical analysis of archeological sites. And, and also, um, you know, not just more disciplines like that coming to bear on historical topics, but also uh, being able to jump around in time, um, I think is really, shapes powerfully in different ways people's understanding of history um, that just wasn't available in the classroom. Um, you know, set this book aside and then go to this book and flip through it. Um, you know, on the internet, you can do anything on the internet. And uh, I just think it's been fascinating what's been going on in geneolo genealogical research and how that's changed, um, uh, how, how people approach it with not just like who my great grandmother was or great, 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 great grandfather, but jumping eons in time, thousands of years and across continents and genetic pools. Um, so it's very different than the way many of us were trained. Yeah, I mean, I'd say that um, 
it, it, you know, it's here, whether it's good or bad, but um, it opens up a, a real can of worms too. Um, you know, Sam Weinberg wrote about this not too long ago in his book, you know, why learn history when it's all on your phone um, and talking about how everybody, you know, academics, historians included, um, actually aren't very good at, you know, sourcing what they're reading online. Um, you know, if it's in their exact area of expertise, but you step outside of, you know, my, my areas and I can be duped all over the place. Um, and, you know, our students can be, I see it all the time in, in school. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just <laughs> one, more, one more thing to teach, I guess. I'll be honest, I, I, I tried to make the case 10, 15 years ago that the uh, history's real op opportunity to, to, uh, to serve would be actually to set, you make information literacy a key component of, of history information because uh, of history teaching, because frankly, we're one of the few disciplines that cares deeply, deeply about facts and evidence and following the evidence to its source. And the fact that as, as Sam describes in his book, that we are as uncritical consumers is probably why I never managed to get any interest in that at, <laughs> while I was at the AHA off the ground. And so the fact that we still, that the web simply seems to replicate the information bubbles and to, and to reify information bubbles in ways that, you know, Roy Rosenzweig never even imagined. Uh, I think I, I spend, I, I've had conversations in my mind more than once with, with Roy, just sort of wondering how he would respond to this, since he was really the first information evangelist for this back, going back to the early 90s about the idea of making this information available. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure how he would respond to, to the way things have uh, developed now. And I wonder whether he would be a little bit more pessimistic about <laughs> the, the value of making all this information available online, because there's obviously a lot of garbage out there that we have to compete with and we should be doing a better job of competing with it but I think that was a big part of Roy's message and I will stop. <laughs> I'm struck by the fact that actually we're ending on an entirely appropriate note for a group of historians which is to answer a question with it's complicated. Um, <laughs> with that I'd like to to thank the AHA staff and thank all of you panelists. This has been a great discussion and I want to turn it back over to Debbie with apologies for running three minutes over. No problem at all. Uh, well, thank you all for a fascinating conversation. Um, a recording of this webinar will be available on the AHA's YouTube channel within about a week or so. It sometimes takes us a little while. Um, and you can also find recordings of past virtual AHA events on that channel as well. I'd like to thank again our generous sponsors, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Stanton Foundation, the History Channel, and Oxford University Press. Thanks to everyone who submitted questions, um, kept the conversation going. And finally, a special thanks to our panelists today. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.